that we may do just that, that we have yet had another week and that we have come to another blessed Sabbath day that we may open the Word and that we may read and study and that we may worship the Heavenly King. As we study this morning, may we have the blessing from on high. May you work through me today that the Word may be the Word of truth, that I stray not. And I pray, Father, that you will be with us, each one, guide and direct. And we pray these things in the blessed name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, our sermon today is nothing new. In fact, we were adding it up a bit earlier. And the first time I presented this sermon, last time I presented this sermon, was about 22 years ago. So I say that because I was going through some files this week and kind of looking for some things and organizing, and I run across this, and I said, oh, I remember that. That would be absolutely perfect. And so with that thought, I don't want any of you to think that I specifically put this together for you because this was put together 22 years ago. And I didn't know, in fact, I think I can honestly say I didn't know any of you 22 years ago that besides my family, yeah, my wife. So the title of our study is Knowing Christ and known of Him. Knowing Christ and known of Him. And we're going to start with a quote from Signs of the Times. Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898. Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898. And paragraph 1. Professed believers in Christ are many, but few have an experimental knowledge of Him. Few have an experimental knowledge of Him. Well, now let's pause for a moment, and let's look up this word experimental. 1828, Webster's Dictionary, experimental. And I'm going to read the whole entire definition because it is all pertinent. It says, pertaining to experiment, known by experiment or trial, derived from experiment. Experimental knowledge is the most valuable because it is most certain and most safely to be trusted. Number two, built on experiments, founded on trial and observations or on a series of results the effects or operations as experimental philosophy taught by experience having personal experience admit to the holy communion such as such only as profess to appear to be regenerated and experimental christians number 4 known by experience, derived from experience as experimental religion. So experimental literally physically means a practical application. It means a hands-on study. Experimental knowledge In other words, knowledge derived by experiment. An experiment is something that we physically do to gain a better understanding. So now let's go back to our quote. Professed believers in Christ are many, but 
few have an experimental knowledge of him. Few have an experimental knowledge of him. To all practical purposes, they are ignorant of Christ. They know him afar off, but they have no true conception of him. Do you understand this? It says professed believers in Christ are many, but few have this experimental knowledge. Now watch where this all goes. We need to realize that Christ formed within each one of us is the hope of glory. The question comes, do you know Christ? Or does his voice come down to us through the ages saying it with sorrowful pathos as he did with Philip when he walked this earth. Philip said to Christ that he he asked the question, show us the Father. And Jesus replies and says, have I been so long time with you and yet hast thou not known me? John 14, 9. What is the real character of our faith? What is that character? Is our profession really that of another? Now, what do I mean by that? Is our belief based upon that of another's opinion? Do we take the word of God And do we study it and do we found our principles from the word of God or do we subsist on processed food? Now let me explain to you as nicely as I can what processed food is. When we were on the ranch, we had a very good lesson about processed food. And we had a baby calf that was uh, had his mama die. And we had a cow there on the ranch that would adopt anybody. And she was anybody's friend. And so we brought her in so that we could put the calf with her so that we wouldn't have to feed the baby calf on a bottle. She'd just take that one as well as her own and sometimes more if needed. So baby calf is, uh, well, put it this way, mama cow leaves a cow pie as they often do. And baby calf goes over and starts licking the cow pie. And the boss's daughter says, ew, don't eat that. That's processed food. Now, think about it. What a cow leaves behind, what's commonly called a cow pie, is processed food. So now when we bring this over to a spiritual sense, and it says that we may be eating or living on processed food, That is, food given to us by the interpretation, not from the Word, but from another individual, as I'm doing now, literally. And hopefully the Word that I share today will be pure and straight. But that doesn't mean that we have to stop there. We have to go to the Word for ourselves. We cannot live on a profession of someone else because it's processed food. Literally, processed food are the words from the preacher. Is our profession the same as that of the multitudes who thronged and pressed Christ? Or is it that of the woman 
who was healed by her reaching out in faith and touching the hem of his garment. Think about this. Here's Christ. He's walking along and we have all of these people and they're pushing and shoving against him as they're being pushed and shoved by others and they're banging into each other and they're banging into him. And yet one reaches out to touch him. And that touch was different than all of those other touches. She said in her heart, if I may but touch his garment, I shall be whole. Matthew chapter 9, verse 21. Signs of the Times. February 3, 1898. Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898, and paragraph 7. Many, here we go with that many again, many are lamentably ignorant of Christ because they take pleasure in unrighteousness. Now stop and think about it. Christ was surrounded by many, and they were bumping into him. They were so close and pressed. And yet they were ignorant of him. Don't believe me? Stop and think. It was many of those that were in that group that were among those who were screaming and yelling, crucify him. How do we know this? The word of God is clear. That it was those of Israel that did that. It was the professed church that crucified him. Many are lamentably lamentably ignorant of Christ because they take pleasure in unrighteousness. Like the multitude, they continue to touch Christ, but they receive no virtue. For it is not their determination to know Him. They desire to follow their own inclinations. That's like what we just talked about a little bit ago. Traditions. Their own way. But they didn't want to know Christ. When they see, going back to our quote here, when they see that they can profess to follow Christ without practicing self-denial, they are on His side. But, when they are called upon to deny themselves... They are no longer attracted to him. Remember, I'm quoting. This is Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898, paragraph 7. By their course of action, they say, I want not thy way, O Lord, but I want my way. Ever heard the saying, my way or the highway? That's literally what the professed followers of Christ were doing. And you know what? It's still happening today. It's still happening. Many out there today profess to follow Christ. We have all of these different groups And this group says they have the way. And this group says they have the way. And another over here in this church and that church. They all profess to have their way. And that's the problem. It's their way, not Christ's way. But the minute that we bring to them or anyone bring to them and show them Christ's way of practicing self-denial, suddenly they make a change. They like to be able to watch their movies. They like to be able to dress how they dress. They like to be able to eat when they want to eat. They like to eat what they want to eat when they want to eat it.
That seems to be human nature. That we want it my own way. Not Christ's way. And we make up all kinds of excuses as to why we can't obey Him. How many of us today are making excuses instead of going to the Word, opening the Word, and reading there and understanding the message of the Word? How many of us have read the Word and yet at the same time either don't understand it or we read over it and go, yeah, that's nice. And we just kind of go on in our own way. Let's go to Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. And starting with verse 9. Luke chapter 18. Starting at verse 9. We're going to read a, a... I guess I'd call it a parable. Here. A story about two individuals that Christ told. And this is the difference between the one who wants their own way and the one who wants Christ's way. Luke chapter 18, starting at verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Isn't that the majority of professed Christians today? By far. By far the majority. Verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. So what is our true relation to Christ? What is our true relation? Are we the re- are we the publican or are we the Pharisee? How do we stand? Do you realize this is about us? This is not just two people back in the Christ time. This is about Christ's professed followers today. You know, it's illustrated that by those who thronged and pressed Christ when he was here on this earth, and yet who received no benefit because they did not touch him by faith. Have you reached out by faith? to touch Him? Or are you still pleased and happy in your profession of righteousness while you still go on in your own way? Let's go to Signs of the Times, January 27, 1898. It's January now. January 27, 1898, paragraph 1. As Christ was speaking his last words of instruction to his disciples before his crucifixion, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us, John 14, 8, which we've already looked at. Amazed at his dullness of comprehension, Christ asked with pained surprise, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? That's John 14, 9. The disciples had been Christ's companions for nearly three years. 
They had listened to his words, witnessed his mighty works, and heard him say to the Pharisees as he read their thoughts, I and my Father are one. John 10.30 And he was astonished, that is, Christ was astonished, that they, that is, the disciples, did not yet know him. Now, let me bring this right on down to home. Because it's easy for us to say, oh, yes, we understand, we know, you know, we can look at their experiences and see. But they walked with him in person and didn't get it. How many of us where we can only walk by faith and we don't get it? Back to our quote. If they had not been so slow of comprehension, if they had been more devoted hearers and doers of the Savior's words, they would not thus have grieved his heart of love by their unbelief. Now, how many of us today are nothing more than hearers and not doers? We have to do the will of our Savior. If they had not been so slow of comprehension, if they had been more devoted hearers, and doers of the Savior's words, they would not have thus grieved Him. Now let's go back to Signs of Times, February 3, 1898, paragraph 1. Today we hear Philip's words double repeated by those who have had evidence upon evidence, weighty and most solemn. Professed believers in Christ are many. But few have an experimental knowledge of Him. To all practical purposes, they are ignorant of Christ. They know Him afar off, but they have no true conception of Him. Many from age to age have been, as it were, in the presence of Christ, have witnessed the manifestations of heavenly light, have seen the deep movings of the Spirit and the power of God, and yet have failed to appreciate these gracious tokens of His goodness and love. To all practical purposes, do you understand the many you understand what many is? That's the majority. The majority of professed Christians today do not have an experimental knowledge of Christ. They don't know Him. And keep that in mind as we continue on. So I want to ask you another question. What is the character of our faith. What is the character of our faith? Is it the same as that of the multitudes who thronged and pressed Christ? Or is it like that of the woman who was healed by touching him? She urged her way through the crowd, saying, If I may but touch his garment, I shall be made whole. And how quickly Christ distinguished the touch of faith from the casual touch of the crowd. What is our true relation to Christ? Is it illustrated by that of those who thronged and pressed him? and yet received no benefit because they did not touch Him by faith. The Son of the infinite God tasted death for every one, man, woman, and child. He left the royal courts 
and clothed his divinity with humanity that he might make a way of escape. That we might be reunited with him and his father. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I actually would love to read the whole chapter because it's very powerful. And I'm seeing it in a new way. But we're going to just go to one verse. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that he through his poverty, that ye, that is all of us, through his poverty might be rich. He gave up everything for us. Everything. He gave up a perfect world to come here and to be spit on and beaten and crucified. And we're not willing to give up our bag of chips or our jewelry or our cigarettes or our drink, our coffee, whatever else it may be that we're not willing to give up for Him. He gave up all eternity. He didn't know if He was going to be able to be reunited with His Father. And He came here to win a battle for us. And we can't even and aren't willing to give up a one little thing or two for him. If Christ were here today among us physically, as he was physically when he came at the first advent, Putting it into today's thoughts and standards, would you say, hey, buddy, let's go on over to McDonald's and get a burger? They make the best burgers, you know. Or would you, uh, if that was your normal habit, I'm saying, or would you be ashamed to have him go with you? When you get dressed in the morning, Knowing that he was coming to your house today, would you put on something different? Would you decide to uh, not stop for that cup of coffee or if he was traveling with you on your way to work? How differently would you act? And yet... We, by faith, have Christ with us, and yet we go on dressing and eating and drinking and living as though we're of the world. And that's the professed Christians. That's, we're not talking about the worldlings. And when Jesus was here on this earth, He did not walk often with kings and nobles, with the wealthy of the earth. He came to be with the poor, those who were obliged to toil for their living. Fishermen is pretty low status, and yet those were the ones that he cho- chose to be his closest friends the tax collectors, etc. He was misunderstood. He was falsified, hated, maligned. And that was by his own church and family. Those of the world, many of them thought better than that of him. He was rejected. 
go to Isaiah. Let's prove this. I don't want you to think that this is just from Mark's word. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53 and starting with verse 3. It says, He is despised and rejected. Hmm, didn't I just say something like that? Of men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. And yet how many of us are so bold and brazen in our errors, in our customs, in our likes, in our excuses for why we have to disobey His plain commands, that we continue on. Let's go to First Peter. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter two. There it is. First Peter chapter two. And we want to go to verse twenty one. Starting at verse twenty one. First Peter chapter two, starting at verse twenty one. For even Hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but commit committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Are we dead to sin? You realize that is the only way that is the only way if we are dead to sin. You see, Christ's robe of righteousness that is freely given to us cannot cover our filthy, dirty, sinful rags. We have to be willing to give them up for new clothing. If we want to keep our wicked ways, our dirty garments, our sinful practices... We will not receive a robe of righteousness. Ooh, now you might think I'm judging, but no, isn't I'm just that's what we just read. It's exactly what we just read. And we'll continue on and give more evidence for this. Let's go back to Signs of the Times, February three, eighteen ninety eight, paragraph three. The sins of every man were punished. In Christ, they were placed on the innocent sin bearer as though they were his own. They were charged to his account. Christ so loved man, fallen though he is, that he bound up his interest with each sinner. In him, divinity and humanity were united. He linked himself with every son and daughter of Adam, having taken the responsibility of d the of dying in the sinner's stead his interests are identified with those of every member of the human family and every evil deed every transgression every rebellion whether of thought we've studied a whole study on that one or action pierces the heart of Christ, for he has pledged himself to represent humanity. 
He gave up so much to make a way of escape for us. And we, sinful mortals, could care less. The many, as we read, the majority, not of the world, but the majority of those who profess to know Him. By taking on human nature, on Himself, Christ fastened each sinner to Himself with threads of sympathy and love that can never be broken. He shall say one day very, very soon with awful majesty these words. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Revelation 22, 11 and 12. We must individually accept Christ as our only hope. We must know Him and be known of Him. I want to expound on that thought for just a moment before we go back to the Scriptures. We must know Him. So all of those people that thronged Christ and were bumbling and jostling along as they walked, and they were so close that they banged into him, they knew who he was. Oh yeah, that's that's that Jesus guy. But did he know them? They knew of him. Exactly. But they were not known of Him. For those of you in Canada, you might say you know the Queen. You'd recognize her if you saw her. And yet she doesn't know you. Doesn't think she owes you any favors. Same thing goes for here in the United States. The majority of us would recognize Trump. And yet Trump wouldn't know us. And those are pretty weak examples. But here we have Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And many of us, to profess means literally that we say we know Him. The problem is, if that's where our profession ends, then he doesn't know us. And in that great day, we will be found under the words of he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. Because we weren't willing to give up all of our evil ways. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Ooh, I like that. If any man love God, the same is known of him. That means that God loves him. Okay. Now this sounds awesome. Love God. Yeah, I love Him. Someone could say that they love someone else on earth. Does that person love them? Maybe. Maybe not. So let's go into this a little bit deeper. 
Let's see what's involved with us loving God so that we can be known of Him. Let's go to 2 John chapter 1. Hopefully you have your Bibles. This really is a Bible study. Where is it here? There it is. And this is love that we walk after His commandments. Now we have a definition. So if we say, but if any man love God, so what is love? And this is love that we walk after His commandments. What does it mean to walk after? That simply means to do or to obey His commandments. Okay? So, and this is love that we walk after His commandments. This is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. Now let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 6 and verse 16. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. Do what? Obey. Romans six sixteen. Obey. Obedience unto righteousness. That ties and fits right back to Revelation 22, verse 11. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. The question is, are we righteous? Let's look at one more reference. 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 1 and verse 8. In flaming, fi in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have the end result. And right here in it, Again, is obedience to obey not the gospel. So if we love him, we will obey him, and we won't be making excuses why we cannot obey. Amen. You know, Judas could have justified himself. I was just working. I knew you'd work a miracle, Christ, and and I knew that we were our our monies were really low, and so, you know, I just thought that we could gain a whole lot, you know, in the in the purse here, so that we could make that trip that we were talking about over to. Do you see how he could self-justify his acts? So so easily, and we do it all the time as professed people of God. And yet, we know the end of Judas. He went too far. He waited just a little too long. Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898, paragraph 8. Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898, and paragraph 8. Search the scriptures, for they testify of Christ. If you really desire to have knowledge of Him, you may obtain it. Search the scriptures, that you may know Him, whom to know aright is life eternal. Behold Him, that by beholding you may obey his word. Oh, there's that obedience word again. 
by beholding. See, we obey him not because we have to, because it's a requirement, but because we want to, because we love him. Isn't the way that the way it works, or should work, I should say, with parents and their children? The children obey because they love their parents and they don't want to hurt them. It's not always that case, but that's the way it should be. Let's go back to our quote. Continue to search as for hidden jewels that you may be spiritually enriched. Meditate upon Christ's words and learn what he is to you. As you confess him, lift him up and talk of him. You will gain faith in him and will be imbued with a zeal to become true stewards of his grace. Review and Herald, June 24, 1884. Review and Herald, June 24, 1884, paragraph 3. It says, Create in me a clean heart. This is the begin this is beginning right at the found very foundation of Christian character. For out of the heart are the issues of life. Oh we know in chap in Psalms, let's go there. Let's go to the book of Psalms. Psalms chapter fifty one Psalms chapter 51 and verse 10. Psalms 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. And now if we go over to Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 4. And verse 23, it says, Keep thine thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. This is the beginning. This is where we start. Let's read Review and Herald, June 24, 1884, paragraph 3. Review and Herald, June 24, 1884, paragraph 3. They need great, the needed grace is provided. And the power of the Holy Spirit will work with every effort you make in this direction. If every child of God would seek Him earnestly and perseveringly, there would be a greater growth in grace. Dissensions would cease. Believers would be of one heart and one mind. Do you understand this? If we fully surrendered our lives to Christ, that is, I'm surrendered to Christ and each one of you are surrendered to Christ, if that's the case, then there wouldn't be any dissension. It's what it's saying here. Let me go back, reread this, and continue on. If every child of God would seek Him earnestly and perseveringly, there would be a greater growth in grace. Dissensions would cease. Believers would be of one heart and one mind. And purity and love would prevail in the church. By beholding, we become changed. The more you contemplate the character of Christ, the more you will become comforted or conformed. The more you will, will become conformed to his image. Come to Jesus just as you are. The disunity that we see today among the professed people of God is caused from idolatry. Now that's my statement. 
The disunity among the professed people of God is caused from idolatry. And you know how it's idolatry? It's because they are all worshiping the idol called self. Self. See, when we stand debating how to best say this, when we self-justify ourselves for why we do what we do, when we say, I must have it my way, We're literally believing in self-idolatry. Now, we can go to Exodus. Let's do that. Let's go to the book of Exodus. Just for a moment. Let's go to the book of Exodus. And let's look at chapter 20 and verse 3. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So what is it? If we set up self, other gods. It's idolatry. That's exactly it. Idolatry. Do you realize... That when you make excuses, as many do, we're setting ourselves up as idols, and that's why there's so many dissensions and disunity in the church among God's professed people. It's because somebody, one party, both parties, has self as idolatry. So the question really comes down to, are we friends or enemies of Christ? You are my friends. If ye do whatsoever I command you, he says. So when we set up self idol, now we're not obeying, Therefore, we're not his friends. Therefore, we're counted as the unrighteous of Revelation 22. Are we friends or enemies of Christ? This is a very salvational issue. This question is of eternal interest, yours and mine. Today, we must make our calling and election sure. We cannot trust to a fluctuating, haphazard faith. Oh, today, I'll, I'll, I'll do good today, and tomorrow I'll, I'll, well, you know, it's back to the movies. But, you know, I made it all day today without watching a movie. Whatever our excuse may be, we all do justifying things. Or we look at someone else and we go, well, they do it, so what's wrong? Or they did this and this and this, so why can't I do that? And then later we say, oh, that was just because I was so depressed and discouraged because of what so-and-so did that I went and did this other. We're still making excuses, just like Adam and Eve. Adam. What's well, that woman you gave me? It's her fault. And of course, she promptly blamed it on the devil. It's about time. God's professed people take responsibility for their own actions. Because our own actions are going to be, be what makes the difference as to whether we are known of him. It absolutely astounds and amazes me that as we get phone calls and emails 
we get lots, quite a few, I won't say lots, but we get quite a few responses to videos online. And somebody will respond to us. And we'll give them, as we often try to do, not our words, but the word of the Lord. We'll give them, you know, say YouTube, we'll give them half a dozen Bible references to prove the statement. And they come back with a, you might say, a hissing and a growling because that's not how they see it. Setting up opinion or self as a higher way. Somebody calls and we take them to the Bible in the spirit of prophecy and we give them numerous references and they go, I don't think so. Why is it that we can't agree on the Word of God? We're told it's so simple a child can understand it, yet all of our childish ways are turning our back to it. And it's because of number one problem, self. You realize you are your worst enemy? I am my worst enemy when it comes to salvation. Mm -hmm. It's all about self, overcoming self. Eve thought that it was okay to eat that apple between meals. But before that, she thought that it was okay to separate from her husband. After all, I'm really getting bored with what he's doing here and I've been wanting to go for a little walk and he's just not ready yet. And Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898, paragraph 9. Signs of the Times, February 3, 1898, paragraph 9. Christ must be our personal Savior. And He cannot be this unless we have an experimental... Remember we started out with understanding what that word was? He cannot be this unless we have an experimental knowledge of Him. A casual knowledge of Him will not avail. Our knowledge must be practical. It must make us like Him. Was Christ found at the movie theater? Was he sound, found sitting in front of the videos? Was he found down at the uh, local pub? Was he found eating those things that the Bible clearly instructs are wrong? Stop and think just a little bit. There was no sin found in Him. And yet we make excuses for our sins so that we can go on in our way because we like it. Because it goes against self. Going back to our quote, this world's eternal interests, literally their salvation, depends upon men and women knowing Christ as their individual personal Savior. See, a casual, a casual knowledge is not enough. We need a deep understanding of our Savior. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 17. John chapter 17 and verse 3. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. See, this is what it's all about. We have to know the only true God. God. And 
His Son, Jesus Christ, whom was sent of His Father. This is eternal life. If we reject the idea that we need to know God, we're literally choosing because that's what it's all about. We choose whether we have salvation or not. If we reject the only true God and Jesus Christ, we're rejecting eternal life. Signs of the Times, January 27, 1898, paragraph 8 and 10. Signs of the Times, January 27, 1898, paragraph 8 and 10. These words, which is speaking of what we just read, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. These words mean much. It is only by knowing Christ that we can know God. The scent of God calls upon all to listen to these words. They are the words of God, and all should give heed to them. For by them they will be judged. To know Christ savingly is to be vitalized by spiritual knowledge. To practice His words, without this all else is valueless. We have to have, and this is my words, we have to have a living faith. We have to put into practice the word of truth. If we just talk about it, it isn't enough. We have to put it into action. When we read something in the scriptures, we need to be asking ourselves the question, do I need to make a change here? Is this describing me? When we read something from the testimonies, we, and she's written a specific testimony to a person, we need to put our name in that blank and say, is it I? as the disciples once said as they sat around that table. Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Because you realize I gets in the way. That's self. Going on with our quote, Christ calls upon us to hear His words that we may know Him. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Matthew eleven fifteen. We are not to hear as did those of whom the apostles said. The word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Hebrews 4, 2. Those who hear savingly are those who hear in faith and who give earnest heed. That's action. Give earnest heed to the things which they have heard, lest at any time they should let them slip. Now, let's go to our Bibles again. Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. We've got just a little bit more here to finish up this study. Hang in there. Matthew chapter 7, and starting at verse 21. Matthew 7, starting at verse 21. And it says, Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Verse 22. Many. Pause. Let's look at this word, many. Strong's, Greek, 4183. Strong's, 
Strong's Word, uh, Greek 4183. And I'm going to attempt to say it, probably wrong, but hopefully you'll be able to get the point anyway. The word is polus. P-O-L-O-O-S. Polus. So many polus. And in Strong's the definition, it says including the forms from the alternate polos. P-O-L-L-O-S. Singular. So polos is singular for polus that is plural according to what we're learning from Strong's. Much in respect, or plural, many. So in this case of Matthew 7, 22, the word many is the word polos, or many as in plural, meaning an adverb meaning largely, mostly, Abundant. So many, Matthew 7, 22, many, that is plural, many, as in largely, mostly, many will say to me, that is Jesus Christ, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not been a really good Christian? I mean, after all, I went and I prayed for this person and they were healed. And I gave tithes and offerings to the church faithfully a lot. And I did this and I did that. You realize this is the story of many. This is the story of many. I went to church faithfully. I didn't miss a week. I even kept the Sabbath holy from, from one minute till sundown till one minute after sundown. Let's go back to verse 22. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in, the, in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, that's the many, the G41383 of verse 22, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Now, I have a literal translation on my Bible, or on my in, not in my Bible, but on my computer, in a linear edition, that's a literal word-for-word -word translation. So I want to read to you verse 23. I don't often go to any translation besides the King James, but I thought this was important as I was looking at this, and I did actually 22 years ago. Matthew 7:23. Hopefully you're following along in your Bible. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me those working lawlessness. Depart from me ye that work iniquity, King James says. And the literal translation is those working lawlessness. We have to be law keepers. Not one law of the ten or two. We have to keep all ten in their fullness. And most of us look at the law. Most professed Christians look there. And they will make excuses of things. Oh, yes, um... I don't steal. That wasn't stealing. I just appropriated that. Really? Appropriating? Stealing? I just borrowed it. Uh, do you? Did you get permission? Well, no, I didn't get permission. Do you plan on returning it? No, no, I don't plan on returning it either, but I just borrowed it. They had more than they needed, so I just borrowed it from them. 
See, excusing self for lawlessness, and in the process of that, they're giving up their salvation. They're choosing. Can you imagine coming up to that time and finding out that you were lost because you wouldn't give up French fries in between meals, or because you wouldn't give up something else, chips or pop or oh, what else could there be? A myriad of things. Anything that destroys the body. Or maybe just because you wouldn't give up a bad habit. If we destroy this temple that God has given to us, our body temple in any way, we're breaking His law. Which makes us working lawlessness. And if that's the case, He will say to us, I never knew you. Southern Watchmen. We're almost to our end here on this study. Just a couple of more references. Southern Watchman, June 4, 1903, paragraph 4 and 5. When weighed in the balances of the sanctuary, they are found wanting, for they love self. Christian principle is a way down in the scale, and their profession of knowing Christ is a deception. They approach God with His promises and ask Him to fulfill them when, by so doing, he would dishonor his name. In his mercy and love, the Lord has given this testimony for them. And in the words here traced should be carefully studied. Christ gave his life to make it possible for the human family to have another trial. You see, Adam and Eve were put on trial and they failed. Which means that we were headed for eternal damnation, destruction. And Christ said, let's give them one more chance. Let's give them one more chance. I'll go and be the mediator for them. I will give up all of heaven. I love them so much. And yet, we don't have enough love for Him to make a change. To form such characters as will entitle them to be called the sons and daughters of God, members of the royal family, children of the heavenly King. John chapter 15, the book of John. Chapter 15, starting at verse 4, it says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Signs of the Times, January 27, 1898, paragraph 13. God has measured how much it costs to save man. This salvation was accomplished only by the sacrifice of himself in his Son. God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Earthly parents love their children. How then did God feel when the son of his love was despised by those whom he came to elevate and ennoble and save. That's you and me. Back to our quote. He saw him dying on the cross, mocked and jeered, and, and mocked at and jeered at by the passerby. And he hid, as it were, his face from him. Christ was bearing the sin of the world and dying in the sinner's stead. Exalt the God of heaven. You who can realize the depth of his self-sacrifice, for he suffered with his son. Let's go to John chapter 15 and starting with verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. This is the substance of the covenant which, is, which God has made with his people. Let's go to 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, starting at verse 3. And hereby we do know that we know him. If we keep his commandments, he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar. That means lawbreaker. And the truth is not in him. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to, a walk, to walk, even as he, that is, Jesus Christ, walked. Jesus was a law keeper. Are you? Southern Watchman, June 4, 1903, paragraph 9. Southern Watchman, June 4, 1903, and paragraph 9. I am commissioned to say that the piety and spiritual discernment and righteousness of those who profess to believe the present truth must be pure and holy. Their characters must be entirely transformed by divine grace, else they will never see the kingdom of God. They will perish with the wicked. I'm quoting. I know not how to make the people understand this, and yet it is a case of life and death with them. Will they confess their sins? Will they humble their hearts before God? Before it shall be too late. End quote. Professed believers in Christ are many. But few have an experimental knowledge of Him. My friends, you need that experimental knowledge in Jesus Christ. 
And without it, it looks pretty like a dim road. And I want to leave you with one thought, and that is this. Is Christ formed within you the hope of glory? Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come before you. We need to cease our profession. We need an active, working obedience. You've come. You've made the way possible. You unlocked the doors, as it were. You have given us the power and the strength to be overcomers. But unless we open that door, and unless we follow you all of the way and obey you because we love you, It will be a dark, evil way. But if we cling to our Savior and keep our eyes upon Him and that our touch may not be a casual, casual brush, but that it may be a clinging, that we may have salvation. And I pray, Father, in my feebleness of Endeavor to present this message that you will cause my weakness not to be seen and that the message will go to the hearts of each individual, those with us today and those that will watch later. May this message of life and death make a difference in each life. And we pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the one who died for us. Is our business here.
To live.